Hallo Marc. Wait a second. My headphones. Hallo? I can't hear you. I'm on mute, but I can't hear you. You can hear me now? There we go. I can hear you now. Yes. Excellent. Perfect. <laughs> Good. It was, I was just to say that we're just waiting for a few more people and then we'll, we'll make a start. But um, just seeing some more people join as we're, as we're talking. So welcome, okay. everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. <clears throat> Okay, well, uh, we'll make a start because it's eight o'clock. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, this is the first in our series of Cortex Pro Talks, where we'll be chatting over the next few weeks to some of the world's leading ice climbers, skiers, mountaineers, um, professionals who all really share one thing in, in common, the, the challenge of pitting themselves against the elements in their quest for ever greater adventures. Um, our first guest this evening, or our first guest in the um, in the series of talks, really, is um, is Ines Papa. Um, hello, Ines. Um, hello, hello, Ines Mark. A, Hi, everyone. Uh, Ines <laughs> is a, a climber and uh, alpinist with a twenty-year career already behind her, and no doubt a fair few adventures ahead, as we'll um, hear about this evening. She's sponsored by one of our favorite mountain brands, Art Terex, um, and it was also four times ice climbing world champion as well. So um, uh, she's tonight she's going to be talking about um, a little about what she's been up to over the last seven months whilst the rest of us, or whilst we've all been in lockdown, um, really unusual times. Her and her husband, Luca, have been searching out new ascents near their home in Bavaria. And uh, tonight she joins us from Slovenia. Is that is that right? Yeah, you've driven to yeah, Slovenia. That's right. Today. It, yeah. it just like I changed my mind a little bit since I think that talking that series of talks is a bit more about winter and ice and uh, alpine climbing. And the past okay. seven months were more or less about, you know, it was a summer season. So I'm going a little bit further back in the last two years and like to talk about. Some of my most intense and uh, okay. uh, climbs I've been doing in the past two years. Great. Okay. Best. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, not at all. No, no, no. I've I've seen some of the pictures, so I know we're into in for um, a great <laughs> uh, a great talk. Anyway, so uh, just a few things yeah. before we start. We're we're um, this is this is obviously a live event, um, and uh, feels please feel free to uh, put any questions in the chat box um, for uh, Ines. And we'll get to them as we um, as we go, and at the end as well, we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, it's also being uh, broadcast live on Facebook, so if you want to, if some the connection sort of disconnects for whatever reason, then you can catch up on whatever you've missed there. So uh, has a habit of doing that, and I do hope you'll stick around till the end because um, at the very end we've got fantastic um, prize as well for anyone who sticks around till the end, and that's um, an Atom LT hoodie. Up for grabs so we'll um we'll it's give you cool. some I can win something mark i can, can win something. As well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's Sounds great exciting okay so yeah. i'm gonna stay until uh, the end for sure <laughs> excellent great thank okay. you that's good yeah um so i'm gonna hand over to in uh, i'm going to um, mute my mic so uh i'll hand over to you now Ines. thank you yeah and whenever you have questions mark just jump in and um let me know i am fine with answering questions during my talk anyways but yeah since this is a very special situation for me talking in front of my computer and not in front of you guys in a huge audience i've been in the uk at the fort william festival some years ago and it was such an amazing crowd and i really miss talking to you in person like uh, it's hopefully gonna be happen again one day and um, I am super excited to see you all again one day. So, um, okay, now we have the first picture. 
Um, this shows me as an ice climber, some or most of you might know me as an ice climber only, but it was actually more or less the beginning of my career that I really started to feel that kind of freedom in the mountains, climbing big uh, routes in the mountains. And yeah, there we go. Uh, but ice climbing, mixed climbing, I've been in Scotland uh, several times and been really lucky with conditions, partners. I climbed with Ian Parnell, I climbed with Sam Yearsley, with Dave McLeod, all amazing characters. And ice climbing was always a really important part of my life as a climber. But over the years, I noticed that ice climbing only is just not enough. I wanted to, to you know, transmit my skills from what I learned in the mountains on ice into the big mountains, into the ranges. And of course, traveling became more and more a really important part of my life. And this hurts my heart so badly that we can't really travel where we want these days, but this is how we have to, what we have to deal with, all of us right now. And uh, well, I'm sure better times will come, but the globe is a huge playground for big alpine climbs in those ranges. And one of the most, um, difficult ones for me was uh, Kisil Aska because I tried, I attempted that mountain three times in my life, like three expeditions to the same mountain, not even 6,000 meters high, but fairly hard. Um, the mountain kicked our ass again and again. And once I met Luca, my current husband, um, I noticed that is probably the person I'd like to attempt again. And I knew I wouldn't go a fourth time. So Luca and I, we came in 2016 from the other side, from the Chinese side. So the approach was way shorter. We got way more knowledge from all my earlier attempts back in the, in the other years. And yeah, finally, we found the face in really amazing conditions. But again, as Every other attempt, we got into a huge storm late in the evening, and but we were high enough to that we couldn't really uh, bail. But we found ourselves in a pretty exposed uh, position high up the mountain, like close to the top, but just not there. And I was like, "Oh no, this is not true now. Why is it, is it happen again? We are running into storm." But we suffered through the storm. We uh, had a terrible BB. Uh, luckily, we were both yeah, close enough already that we were sharing one backpack, uh, sleeping bag. And the next day, blue sky, again, brilliant weather. And yeah, we continued our way up to the highest uh, point of that mountain. Kisil Asker became um, really important part of my life because I invested so much and this is what I always love to tell people hey oh ever you have a dream you have a project you you got your ass kicked go and try again and believe me or not once you will succeed and uh, we succeeded and it was for sure one of my best days ever in my life and all the disappointment from earlier attempts was just forgotten and when you look at the face and you draw in this beautiful line that you just climbed, it makes you feel proud. It was the first ascent. It was like attempted by so many other teams and everyone could have been doing it if the conditions were right. But uh, if you're there at the wrong time, you can't succeed. So we were lucky enough to be fast enough to um, get the right conditions and we finally did it. So with that kind of great feeling and uh, positive mindset, we uh, realized many other projects together, but also one of the most pretty ones in Bavaria at home where, I, yeah, where I've been living in the past 25 years of my life. So I call this place my home, Berchtesgaden, and our 
mountain is called Batsman. It's really scenic mountain, but no one has done this traverse all of the summits in, a, in the winter. So Luca came up with the idea and we just had to, to find the right window, the right conditions. We knew it's all about the conditions. It would be a long, long day, but uh, if we continue and if we yeah, find a smart way how to climb, how to climb it and we have a, a smart logistic, we would do it. Uh, but then the big guy came at the very end and we didn't find the existing route. It was just all covered in snow and ice. So we apparently climbed a new line up to the highest point and after 36 hours and many, many vertical meters, like 3,600 or something, um, we finished the traverse, the first winter traverse of Batsman, which was just the perfect uh, preparation and um, uh, training for a big expedition in the Himalayas. And since I have never been on an 8,000 meter peak, that was became more and more my desire to at least try a big mountain in the Himalayas in a good style, an alpine style. So we went to Shisha Pangma, South Face, in 2018, in the summer, and, uh, and not in the summer, in the spring season. And our goal was to climb this huge 3,000 meter South Face of the mountain, uh, maybe hopefully on a new route. And so far we were really um, spoiled by good luck of weather, of conditions, of teamwork, of our personal health. And so we were convinced we can succeed here as well. But things on this huge phase changed um, our mindset dramatically in a way that I still have a hard time to, to forget about what happened. Because we, um, of course, we were acclimatizing properly because the high altitude would take a lot of energy from us. So we had to be prepared really uh, properly. And the neighborhood mountain just 7,000 meters high, almost killed our lives while we were sleeping in a tent because the weather forecast was really unpredictable and the snowfall didn't stop and this huge flank above us was just steep enough that the snow wouldn't stay and it came all the way down onto our tent and uh, while we were sleeping we could feel the pressure of the snow and I woke Luca up and put him off the tent and yeah, we just made it off the tent right at the time. Um, so there was no way we would keep going this expedition. We were so shocked and it was such a close call that we had quite a difficult time um, to understand what, what was wrong. So far, we always got the feeling we have everything under control. We can, with the you know, power we have and with the passion we bring, every, nearly everything is possible, but uh, the mountain told us a different story. And this really took us uh, quite a little bit of time to recover from the shock and all the desire about climbing alpine style in higher ranges was just gone. And but climbing has always been part of my life, of Luca's life. And so we couldn't just stop climbing, but climbing has so many different phases, you know, you can, so many different types. And we focused for quite a bit on rock climbing in the home area and open nudes and played in the uh, vertical uh, rock phases that but slowly, both of us, like Luca and I, we could feel slowly the desire coming back for, yeah, big uh, ranges, not quite enough to, to go back to the Himalayas, but um, finding a, a place where we would feel safe enough to 
disappear if something happened and yeah the Canadian Rockies came in our minds uh, in our mind and since we have many friends over there in Canmore in Canada Apteryx is a brand from Canada at home in Vancouver so it feels like my second home and that was just the time when we planned our trip to to Kenmore to the Banff Mountain National Park but we were we always wanted to stay open-minded with where we would go, what we would do. We had many, many ideas and uh, many plans, but we wanted to keep things open and to just do what feels appropriate and, and, and right. So um, our first trip into the Valley of Ten Peaks was just, more about exploring than uh, that we really planned a difficult climb but we had all our gear with us just in case you never know it's a long hike in many many hours um, the roads are covered in snow and then you put up, up your tent at the bottom of those big faces that's uh, so remote there's no other climbers um, it's just it was just good to be back in the mountains after nearly a break of alpine climbing. But again, we faced uh, the difficulties of weather and conditions. It was snowing and like uh, every day, um, we could face some really dramatic spin drift and we just saw it's too early. We have to wait and to be patient enough to find safe conditions because just attempting without really knowing we would make it uh, or <laughs> at least we had a, a plan B, um, that was the plan. So we I turned back into town to Kenmore and had this amazing um, chance to run into Barry Blanchard. He is a legend. He is like the guy who opened back in the days, many, many of the big climbs in the Canadian Rockies. And he was so helpful, so supportive with uh, information, with uh, stories he's been sharing from his ascents back in, in the 80s. So one of the routes he's been, he's, he has done with his team, Dave Tiesmond and um, Carl Tobin, was a Mount Faye, the East Face. But Barry also told us they couldn't finish the line straight up to the summit. So they had difficulties with, uh, snow, uh, with avalanche. They got hurt and they had to abandon. So they finished the climb, but not in the straight line. So this was still an open project and everyone was kind of curious if this was possible. The face is quite big. It's like over a thousand meters and sustained difficult climbing. Yeah, but we just had to wait the right conditions and right, right the moment when the conditions turned into brilliant. So I guess that was our, our hope. But if you don't check, you won't know. Uh, we ran into our friend, Brett Harrington. She is a longtime friend that she was like trying to find climbing partners. So we invited her to join us because we thought being in a team with the three of us totally makes sense. And uh, she kind of, she was, it seems she was the right person to join the climb on Mount Bay East Face. But this time we were smarter. We didn't carry our gear um, uh, on our backs, but we were pulling it behind in sledges because the approach is long, but not super steep. And the snow was just perfect for that. So yeah, then we set up our first little uh, camp on the base of this mountain. And yeah, it was like, everything seemed right. We looked at the mountain, we looked into each other eyes and we could feel the positive energy in this little team. And yeah, we couldn't really, a uh, way to finally start climbing. But it was a short rest after the long hike in because we started at midnight because we knew from Barry Blanchard that the lower part of the face is really uh, 
come for avalanches. Once the sun hits the face in the earth in the morning, we should, uh, uh, we should, he said, we should try to be as high as possible. So we were climbing in a really good speed, like uh, safe, but still fast. And um, we gained hundreds and hundreds of meters uh, till the sun would hit the face. And all of a sudden we got a little bit into spin drift, but this was nothing we were worried about. And yeah, the closer we got to the head wall, the more convinced we were uh, that it, it's probably possible. For sure, not easy, anything else than easy, but maybe possible. And yeah, there's always this point of no return, you know, when you hit the upper head wall, you have to, in Alpine style, you only bring a, a limited amount of gear and the repelling. The higher you climb, the smaller the chance is that you're able to repel with what you have on your harness. So uh, we had to make a decision here, which was quite a start of the steep part of the wall. And, Luca looked around the corner to find a smart start of this steeper part. And all of a sudden he found this crack system, super steep, up, overhanging like a uh, mixed something like really, really ridgy long moves. And it was like uh, belaying him was really impressive because he was like flying up, not the first, not the first go because he was aiding this pitch like from uh, each piece of gear he could place to another one. But then once he finished this pitch, I could see him thinking if we still have the time, he could free the pitch. And then I was kind of asking him if he want to come down because we could see we still have enough time and we were prepared for a BB anyways. So he was really happy to uh, sent this pitch second go uh, turned out to be a difficult pitch in proper mountain boots like m8 or even a little harder and brett and i started following and luca kept going leading this block he was really in his element he was flying up you could see his um skills like over like what he gained over many many years in his home mountains in slovenia and also in the himalayas and he was the engine of the team for sure he was the engine and uh, we could just do anything to support him and uh, take over the lead whenever he was tired so the day was nearly at the end and uh, we were guessing there was still another half day to the summit so we prepared ourselves to a quite uncomfortable BB on a, a little ledge of snow we shoveled and we're waiting the next morning. And that was when Brett started leading a couple of pitches and we noticed it's anything else than over. It was still steep, like vertical uh, rock uh, mixed uh, with ice and alpine ice, you know, the quality of the rock got kind of um, scary here and there the gear we could place got less and less and every single move needed to be really safe because we knew no one will uh, help us up here we can only help ourselves so a single fall would be a terrible uh, accident and so yeah you try to climb safe but kind of fast at the same time um, and then I took over the lead and uh, kept going. So we could slowly see ourselves closer to the end of the uh, climb. And yeah, still pitch after pitch was forcing all of our left power, the power we had left. And it was, it was really difficult. We could just hope for a stable weather the second day that we would at least have some visibility when we top out and uh, descend on the mountain the other side in hiking terrain but in terrain where you really want to see something but yeah the higher we climbed the worse the conditions got the snow got deep and Luca was digging in snow like for half an hour and uh, 
got kind of dark when he did his last moves to the edge of the mountain. Like it was overhanging, it was steep and, and it was just, you knew, you knew, you can see this little cornice on top. We had to get around this cornice and then it would be over. So this is uh, what, uh, what the last pitch was. It got kind of dark. Uh, Brett and I started following and it got nearly night when we all stand on top of this mountain. And you can see in our, it's a shitty photo, I know, but it was a selfie uh, done with the phone. And, but you can see our happy faces, but the descent was still ahead of us and it was a long one. It took us another two days to find back down to um, Moraine Lake and uh, finally back to Kenmore. But when we hiked back with our last little bit of energy and food we had in the backpacks, we promised each other that this route deserves a special name and so it was obvious we would dedicate the route to Mark andre uh, our late friend and Brett's partner. So he had actually the plan to climb this route with Luca earlier before he passed away and got killed in an avalanche. And um, he had this magic song in mind from Simon and Garfunkel, which is called The Sound of Silence. And that seemed just the perfect name for a perfect line. In my opinion, a really good style. And this is, yeah, this is my little story about alpine climbing and how I learned to find the desire again after a difficult time with fears and um, also, yeah, uh, moments where didn't really want it to touch my eyes tools again, but this mountain changed everything. And yeah, I'm happy that I found the right partner, not just in life, but also for climbing. Luca and I, we are having plans um, every minute and uh, we are always ready to climb mountains, whatever the situation allows. So um, hope we can make it to Alaska next spring. That was the plan for this year. But uh, COVID-19 changed everything. And yeah, this is actually my little talk to you guys tonight. And if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. It is, thanks, thanks very much for that. That's, um, that's great, it makes me, makes me definitely want to go to the mountains. Um, <laughs> really inspirational, thank you. Um, got a few questions that came in. Um, so as you were talking there, <clears throat> Um, Abby and her eight-year-old Annabelle. Um, Annabelle said she's really enjoying the talk, so thank you for that. Um, she also asks, um, would like well, she would like to know what your um, favorite snack is to give you energy <laughs> when you're in the mountains. Um, honestly, I love the most a proper sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> but this you can't always have you know it's uh like i like nuts i like um dried fruits uh i also like to eat a piece of speck of uh, lard uh, and some some crackers so but when we when we bv and when we have the time to cook something i use leo food which is a dehydrated food pretty um, natural and, and biological so this is the tastiest for my stomach great stuff i like spec as well that's nice um, um one one other question um obviously after the after the avalanche um so when when did the avalanche happen what what, what was that what year was that trip it was in 2018 on shisha pangma south face okay because yeah you're obviously you're obviously um, a parent, as am I. Um, yes. Has has that? Do you think being a parent has changed your attitude to risk at all? Because how old's your your son now? I guess that happened before. 
Yeah, my son is born in 2000, so he just turned 20 this year. Okay. So he's not a proper child anymore, but of course, he's always my child. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, Mark, this is a good question. And many people ask me about that. But I think I've never been a person that would push it to a level that I wouldn't be, you know, I also have that kind of expectation to myself to always come back home to to have a long life i love to live and uh of course there was often but more in the planning process before i went to a mountain this thinking's like um is this fair towards my son should i really take the risk or not so that was actually one reason i haven't been crazy lots on expedition and also one reason I haven't been on an 8,000 meter peak. But when I went with Luca, I was still not ready to, to die, of course, or to get killed. But he was like 18 years old. And um, I thought with Luca, I feel totally safe. Like he's super smart and always ready to, um, to abandon if it's necessary. So this gives me like the partners, make a difference you know when i got the feeling my partner is pushing it too hard i would not try to catch up with the person again and this is always good to find the right partners when it comes to risk level like the risk level has to be the same level more or less yeah mm. that's great and um does your does your son climb you now Yes, he does. He's more into bouldering, sport climbing and uh, that kind of stuff. Because he loves to sleep in. And <laughs> I think alpine climbing would, uh, no, is, is for sure not what he really wants to do in his life. But honestly, I'm happy about it. I love seeing him cracking. I love seeing him bouldering. And it's just, it's perfect. I like yeah. it. I, I'm, happy. I'm kind of proud he still likes to climb you know because he grew up with climbing and many kids from other parents that grow climb by friends they they can't see it anymore they they are over with climbing when they are 18 and uh, but i think the more you push your kids um the less they do it from themselves the earlier they stop doing it and so i don't know what if i do did everything right but i never pushed my son but i opened him the door to different kinds of activities in the mountain in the mountains and uh, obviously he loves it he still loves it yeah also skiing and yeah that's yeah. Um, it's good advice about uh, children and pushing them into something isn't it it's um um chris asks um how long have you been working with arcteryx and uh what input do you have into their product development um i just thought about that this morning for some reason and believe it or not it's 20 years i'm uh, working with arcteryx wow. it's been a small company back in the days and um but the personal contact and the friendships that grow over the years were just gaining and i could see the products like the product line was growing and growing and now it's 20 years later and I I get everything from Arcteryx that I need for mountaineering and what I appreciate is a lot is not just the quality of the products this is a uh, high end for sure this just fulfills my needs um, in the mountains but also the understanding of what we as athletes what we are doing you know we do risk our lives with what we are doing, but I would never get any feeling from the company that I need to push myself into something I am not ready to do it. So in every single project I'm doing is grown in my own head, in my own mind, and there's never been any, any disappointment. So this has been a really uh, powerful 20 years with the brand. And yeah, of course, it makes me proud to be able to help developing the products, um, testing them, giving feedback to the designers. Um, it's fantastic, yeah. 
at the end you get what you need and uh, without any compromise. Have you um, have you a favorite favorite product that you wear day in day out? I just washed it this morning because I I, I kind of use it every day. <laughs> it's the Nuclei FL okay. jacket. Yeah, yeah, it's I love it. I use it in summer and winter as a base layer, as an only layer, and uh, yeah, it's a really neat jacket, insulated jacket. Uh, for activities in the mountains but of course I also use hard shells a lot alpha SV is a really proper jacket that fulfills all the needs that a uh, uh, climb requires in the mountains it's a lot of you know frustration to a fabric when you know you climb over two days and you don't care about your jacket you just want to get up and survive and at the end of two days it's still alive it still works and yeah this is what what i really appreciate yeah that's quite something um you just put a lot of lot of pressure on you a lot of wear on your gear um kenny <laughs> kenny asks um he's got a few questions actually um when when choosing a line on a first ascent how do you a first ascent sorry when how do you go about it um do you make what you consider to be quickest route or the safest or the most challenging or the most fun or is it something else that's a good question the most eye-catching line that also is a promising a safe climb so of course a new line an unclimbed line is always a big adventure you never know if, if it's possible and the chance to fail is pretty high uh, actually um, but yeah an eye-catching line that you know where the desire is just like it makes me feel this is possible we climb in alpine style i really appreciate climbing in alpine style because you are allowed to be fast with a smaller backpack with a limited amount of gear but it also limits the time of your ascent you know you can't climb for 10 days and nearly in alpine style, because you have to carry food for 10 days, uh, gas for 10 days. And um, this makes things uh, interesting when it comes to speed. So I'm not really into speed climbing, but climbing fast is a good promise on uh, succeeding quite often. Right, thank you. Um... Kenny then asks, um, you, you mentioned that you, you visited the Fort William Mountain Festival a few years ago. Is that right? Yeah. So you've, yes, you've, yes. you've, you've been to Scotland. So he says, how do, you, how do you rate ice climbing in Scotland? I presume you, you did a bit while you were up how there. Do I, how, how, do do you, I, how do you rate ice, ice climbing in Scotland? How do I rate it? Like riding? Uh, rate. So how, how good is it by comparison with elsewhere that you've, you've ah, climbed? It's it's not possible to compare with any, anything. It's so different that there's no comparison possible. It's fantastic. I really love it when conditions are in. Um, the first trip when I've been in Scotland, I brought, let me guess, eight or 10 ice screws, which was a total stupid move because uh, you never find, or nearly never find water ice in Scotland. It's more about, uh, mobile gear, any other gear, but no ice crews. The second trip, I brought two ice crews because I thought just in case. And you know what? I didn't use any. And then my third trip, I didn't bring any. And believe it or not, every ice route was in conditions. Like I would have need eight ice crews to climb a line on uh, on Ben Nevis. But luckily, over the years, I got more and more friends in. Fort William and, and uh, Scotland. So it wasn't a problem to find some ice crews. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, we've got a question here from Anonymous. Um, do, you, do you have any advice for a beginner boulderer looking to get into outdoor climbing? A boulderer? Yeah. Uh, so someone doing indoor climbing looking to get into outdoor climbing. Yeah, I, yeah. I like I think bouldering is the easiest uh, mountain activity to get into the, into the nature without risking your life too much. <laughs> um, well, 
Hmm. I'm not so much into bouldering, honestly, but I think if you read articles, if you get, you know, psyched or like really hard touched by pictures, try to get there and, and have a look and find those great you you you're able to climb in the gym or maybe even start in a lower grading than you're used to climbing the gym i think footwork is a really really important one when it comes to climbing in general and especially bordering and this is something you learn only in the nature not really on plastic thank you um alistair asks He's interested to know if um, the recent um, or the ongoing pandemic, I should say, um, has ham hampered any of your 2020 plans. Can you say that again? So um, the pandemic, the COVID, yes. has it yes. has it affected? So you must have had some plans at the beginning of 2020. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I mentioned already we were supposed to go to Alaska. The bags were packed. Yeah. Uh, everything was organized, logistics, uh, everything. And we were supposed to look at, I was supposed to climb in the Ruth Gorge and later to climb in the Mendenhall region of Alaska and then going to Canada and yeah, keep going on the Panamericana highway towards uh, south to finish that long, long journey one day. So that was just supposed to be the first uh, trip of the Panamericana, but yeah. All of a sudden, it didn't happen. But yeah, I hope we can do it next year. But we did find some really amazing places in our yeah, backyard. <laughs> As many of you probably, we opened new routes. We uh, explored the place. Uh, we climbed difficult uh, rock faces. And uh, it wasn't boring at all. So this, think, this is in Bavaria, is it? You, where yes, you live? Yeah. Yes, Bechtes Garden, Bavaria. I think this is, that we got slowed down a bit in our rhythm with pretty much what maybe everyone needed at some point. Yeah. I don't know. I would never have come up with the idea of going by bike through Switzerland and climb the most iconic faces, which I did in the summer with my friend Caro North from Germany. So we've we spent a month only on our mountain bikes. We're pulling our gear behind and we're climbing as yeah as many faces as we could get there. <laughs> yeah. It was a good experience to not use the car for one month, and I think it was a, uh, also the time to, you know, uh, rethink all the like well, how much traveling we did in the past and how much airplanes were involved and the global warming is just mm. it's so it's so obvious like uh maybe my also mother nature needed that break yeah absolutely because you i mean you've you've traveled the world climbing lots of places haven't you so it must have been particularly tough in in many ways suddenly realizing that was that was not possible, um, but then... Of course, my heart was bleeding, Mark. It was terrible, <laughs> especially because I grew up in Eastern Germany behind the Iron Curtain, and I was 16 when the wall came down, and I was uh, revolution, revolutionary with my parents. We were part of the revolution, and all of a sudden the wall came down and we, we could travel, you know? Um, and since then, since I was 16, I always... I've always been traveling and really enjoyed that freedom of I can go wherever I, I can afford to go. And uh, yeah, all of a sudden it wasn't possible anymore. It was just, it was breaking my heart. Yeah. <laughs> mm. um, just, just a couple more questions, if I may. Um, yes. So uh, we've got one question from Alice. Um, she says, what's, what's your next project? I mean, you touched on that because you didn't get to Alaska this year. Is that is that's planned for next year? We go there next year, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, there are some mountain faces we have, Luca and I have, I have in mind for the winter season in the Alps, which uh, depends on conditions. But yeah, there's definitely enough playground in the Alps that we won't get bored. 
No, that's great. Um, and then um, one final question, I think, from from Kenny is, uh, he says, I notice you, you ski to reach some of your ascents. Do you ever climb with your skis to make a, a ski descent somewhere? So I think there were some pictures of you with your, your skis on. Um, I, can, I really like skiing, but I use skis more or less to approach the mountain and to go back home, but not really for steep skiing. Um, I, I don't know, skiing is a different level. Uh, if you do expeditions like that, it's a different level of skills that you need in skiing and uh, I'm not at this level. Thank you. That's, that's been fantastic. Thank you very much for your time this evening. In us. Um, obviously, under Thanks normal circumstances. Thanks for second. everyone. Thanks well, everyone the for the really nice questions. I really like the questions. It's um, it's fun to they've answer been, them. It, yeah, they've been they've been great. And under nor normal circumstances, we probably would have um, hosted you in in Covent Garden or in Manchester at one of our stores. But um, sadly, obviously, that's that's not the case. But um, yeah. so just maybe one day again, I would love to come over. We, to you yeah, guys. we. We'd love to have you over. That'd be great. Uh -huh. um, just, uh, just to kind of um, go back to what I was saying earlier. Thank you for for joining us tonight. Um, I'm just about to post a link to uh, if anyone wants to enter competition, um, then you can win a, an Atom LT hoodie, courtesy of Art Terex, who've um, been our, our support this evening. Which uh, so thank big thank you to them um, and to Gore-Tex as well. Uh, we've we've got these talks happening over the next four Thursdays. So if you'd like to join us um, next week, we've got um, John Bracey um, talking. Uh, he's one of Britain's foremost alpinists and he'll be uh, talking with us next Thursday evening. So do sign up for that or catch it on Facebook. And um, really all, all I want to say was a big thank you to you and for giving up your, your evening to chat to us. I know it's um, getting on for 10 o'clock where you are now. So, it, um, it's been, it was a been pleasure fantastic. to me. Really, really. Thanks for the invitation, and I'm looking forward to see John's presentation. He's a really <laughs> character. I really like him. How oh, great you know John. Okay, that's great. <laughs> yeah, of course we know each other. <laughs> Such a small, small community, world. isn't it? Everyone knows everyone. Brilliant. Yeah, exactly. So okay. thank you very much, and and thank you everyone for bye joining bye. this evening. Really appreciate it. It's been great. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye.